Good morning, my brothers and sisters. Today is Friday of the eighth week in ordinary time as we move towards our final celebrations of the year after Easter, Trinity Sunday and Corpus Christi. Let us begin as we begin all things in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. A reading from the book of Sirach. Now will I praise those godly men, our ancestors, each in his own time. But of others there is no memory. For when they ceased, they ceased. And they are as though they had not lived, they and their children after them. Yet these also were godly men, whose virtues have not been forgotten. Their wealth remains in their families, their heritage with their descendants. Through God's covenant with them, the family endures their posterity for their sake, and for all time their progeny will endure, their glory will never be blotted out. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Lord takes delight in his people. The Lord takes delight in his people. Sing to the Lord a new song of praise in the assembly of the faithful. Let Israel be glad in their maker. Let the children of Zion rejoice in their king. The Lord takes delight in his people. Let them praise his name in the festive dance. Let them sing praise to him with timbrel and harp. For the Lord loves his people, and he adorns the lowly with victory. The Lord takes delight in his people. Let them sing for joy upon their couches. Let them, let them release high praises of God in their throats. This is the glory of all his faithful. Alleluia. The Lord takes delight in his people. Alleluia, Alleluia, I chose you from the world to go and bear fruit that will last, says the Lord. Alleluia, Alleluia. The Lord be with you. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Mark. Glory to you, O Lord. Jesus entered Jerusalem and went into the temple area. He looked around at everything and since it was already late, went out to Bethany with the twelve. The next day, as they were leaving Bethany, he was hungry. Seeing from a distance a fig tree in leaf, he went over to see if he could find anything on it. When he reached it, he found nothing but leaves. It was not the time for figs. And he said to it in reply, May no one ever eat of your fruit again. And his disciples heard it. They came to Jerusalem, and on entering the temple area, he began to drive out those selling and buying there. He overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who were selling doves. He did not permit anyone to carry anything through the temple area. He taught them, saying, Is it not written, My house shall be called the house of prayer for all peoples, but you have made it a den of thieves. The chief priests and the scribes came to hear of it and were seeking a way to put him to death, yet they feared him because the whole crowd was astonished at his teaching. When evening came, they went out of the city. Early in the morning, as they were walking along, they saw the fig tree withered to its roots. Peter remembered and said, Rabbi, look, the fig tree that you cursed is withered. Jesus said to them in reply, Have faith in God. Amen, I say to you, whoever says to this mountain, be lifted up and thrown into the sea, and does not doubt in his heart, 
but believes that what he says will happen, it shall be done for him. Therefore I tell you, all that you ask for in prayer, believe that you will receive it, and it shall be yours. When you stand to pray, forgive anyone against whom you have a grievance, so that your heavenly Father may in turn forgive your transgressions. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. The Gospel sounds like a, a hodgepodge of different events and teachings, and unraveling it seems confusing at best, <laughs> impossible at worst. So let's begin at the beginning, the fig tree. Jesus wanted to eat of the fig tree. Jesus wanted to have food, sustenance from the fig tree. And he saw its leaves and drew near. But the problem was that the fig tree only looked like it had fruit. It looked like it was in season, but it wasn't. We're told it wasn't the time for figs. There just, there was nothing the tree could really do about it. Its time hadn't come. And yet Jesus curses the fig tree because it had no fruit. That fig tree represents the hardened hearts of the religious authorities at the time. The fig tree represents the fact that they had reached the climax of their teaching, that they could not go past the appearance of having fruit. They would never have fruit. They had reached the gap. There was nowhere to go from there. They couldn't get past the gap. In their hearts, they had sacrifices from God. They could perform sacrifices for sin, sacrifices for prayer, sacrifices for their family, for luck, for prosperity, for rain. They had all of these things, but especially the sin offering, so that they could get right with God. But people were abusing the law. They had turned what God meant to be a mercy an act of conversion into a business transaction. That's what the temple sellers represent. Now, the temple sellers get a really bad reputation. You know, we read this and we think of St. Peter's Square, where the Pope is, and they're selling bobblehead popes, and they're selling soap nuns and, and squeezy nuns for your dog. A stupid stuff. But that's not what the sellers in the temple were there for. They provided a needed service. When you came to the temple, you had to pay the temple tax. But you could not pay the temple tax with an idolatrous coin. At this time, the Roman emperors had begun to mint coins with their images on it, their children's images on it, gods on them, the Roman gods, proclaiming the emperor to be Augustus, to be the revered one, to be worshipped. You couldn't pay the temple tax with that. It was an act of idolatry. So you had to bring your Roman coinage into the temple to the money changer who could give you a special coin with nothing on it, but that had the proper precious metal so that it was valuable and tradable. And that's what you paid the temple tax with for a small fee. That was necessary. There were people there selling turtle doves. Mary and Joseph probably arrived in the temple, went outside the portico, which is very much like St. Peter's Square is to the Vatican and the churches there, 
and they bought two turtle doves. They couldn't bring the animal they wanted to sacrifice with them on the long journey from Bethlehem. So they brought the two turtle doves. They bought them there to sacrifice for Jesus' birth. These money changers, these sellers, they weren't interfering but they were part of the system, part of making God's mercy a business contract that you could go buy a dove, sacrifice it, and oh, done with sin, let's go party. I mean, I don't know how people who believe in once saved, always saved can read these gospels and still believe that because that's what Jesus was railing against. He was railing against the religionists of his time, not the Jewish people in mass, but a particular attitude of the religions of the time that said, God's mercy, I can buy that with a sacrifice without any conversion of heart. And that's why Jesus gets angry and kicks them out of the temple. You're part of this system that is corrupting the human heart. People need to come to pray. And then we're linked back to the fig tree, which is withered because Jesus said, because you appear to have fruit, but have none, you will never bear fruit. And again, talking about that gap that no one could transverse because all the sacrifices in the world would never get us into heaven. They wouldn't. We needed the Messiah to open heaven for us. And they're astonished. It's withered. And Jesus, instead of commenting on the withered tree, now moves to faith. If you believe that your prayer will be answered, it will be answered. Unanswered prayers are part and parcel of religious people. God sometimes says no. But when we ask for the right thing, we always get it. We can't ask for the wrong thing. Can't ask to win the lottery. Can't ask for, you know, this or that. We, we can, but that's not the type of thing that God gives us. We need to ask for endurance, for the Holy Spirit, for grace. And when we have that, we can indeed say, mountain, jump into the sea. Will the mountain jump into the sea physically? No, but it will be moved. It's a metaphor. Not only will it be moved for us, an obstacle, but even if it can't be moved, God shows us a way around it. We have to pray the prayer that Jesus taught us. And he didn't tell us to say, give me what I want. He told us to pray, give me what I need. Your will be done. And I believe that you will give me what I need. And God always does. But again, he now moves to forgiveness. If you're not forgiving, then why would God forgive you? God looks at us through our own glasses, our own perceptions, and says, you know what? You were a hard-hearted person. You demanded perfection. You wanted everything to be your way. Well, you didn't live up to your own standards. And so... You're going to have to deal with that now that you're dead. And that's what God does. So it behooves us to work hard on our spirituality, on our forgiveness, on our prayer life. You know, I always wondered why people cried at weddings. I did. I always wondered what, why people cried. And everyone says, well, because we're happy. Why cry when you're happy? Why cry at a happy ending? Why does it move us so as much as a sad one does? 
happy endings move us because we know there are alternatives to happy endings. We know how things could have ended. We're surprised by happy endings, aren't we? We're shocked. And the shock causes this emotional response that comes out as tears, tears of joy. Happy endings are a surprise. We know there all are alternatives. Well, this is the lesson of Jesus. Yes, if you expect the worst, the worst will always happen, and you'll never be surprised. Someone once told me, if you expect the worst, you will only be pleasantly surprised. But if you expect the best, and you pray to God for the best outcome that he can provide, you will never be surprised, as God will always give it to you. My brothers and sisters, let us pray the prayer that Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. My brothers and sisters, have a wonderful day, and may Almighty God bless your long weekend. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Have a great day.